Hi, I'm Ted Yap. I'm a consultant urologist at uh, Geisman St. Thomas's. Um, I, I also work at HCA. I'm also the principal investigator of uh, the shockwave trial, looking at uh, sorry, shockwave trial, looking at um, therapy after post um, after prostatectomy uh, for uh, men who've had treatment for prostate cancer. Um, with me is uh, Finlay McCaskill, who is my uh, chief investigator. I'm a urology registrar, currently out of training. I'm doing a PhD, in which case I'm currently running this trial, which is going to be quite exciting, looking at a new population predominantly with use in this uh, technology, where we're looking at penile rehabilitation following radical prostatectomy as test says. So we have um, a group of patients who are having uh, qualified under our inclusion criteria, are then invited after um, the operation to have a shockwave session with us. This is um, a series of um, uh, visits uh, lasting about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, they, they come every week uh, for um, basically a, a little probe uh, to be um, administered to uh, the genital area to try and stimulate um, uh, erections to return after prostatectomies. Now, prostate surgery is um, um, uh, quite well known to cause erectile dysfunction, unfortunately. Uh, 70 to 80 percent of men after uh, prostate surgery encounter this issue. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to see if the intervention and early stage right after um, surgery when uh, the nerves and blood vessels are affected by the procedure uh, can be helped to repair. Uh, now Finn, what is the um, uh, scientific background behind uh, potential uh, benefits for, of uh, shockwave erections. So when we're talking about a prostatectomy, it's not about the stage of the cancer, whether or not we can spare the nerves that essentially connect the brain to the erectile function. Um, if the nerves can be spared, there's still injury intraoperatively, so you can still have heat, in, um, heat injury uh, or traction injury at that time, in which case the nerves go to sleep for a period while they recover. And that recovery can take up to a year, maybe even 18 months. And in that time, we know that due, la due to lack of use of the penis, the penis can therefore have scar deposition within it, and therefore you can get erectile dysfunction because of the scar, uh, rather than purely just the lack of the nurse functioning. And so what we're trying to do with the concept of penile rehabilitation is to maintain the healthiness of the tissues and potentially speed up the process of um, healing or speed up the process of rehabilitation in order to try and get back to a quality of life as soon and as quickly as possible. And I think that's the key thing, we're trying to uh, heal the tissue. So um, the common uh, treatments right now for post-prostatectomy um, erectile dysfunction are to use uh, tablets uh, to stimulate an erection. But um, the issue is that if you don't have uh, the nerves uh, to produce the chemicals that give you an erection, um, then you probably won't have uh, a response to, to these tablets. So uh, shockwave therapy offers uh, potentially an interesting solution to that by helping to um, uh, regenerate the, the nerves and as a result um, uh, the blood vessels and the blood flow into um, uh, the tissue of the penis. Now we also have other issues with um, uh, prostatectomy patients, uh, things like penile length loss, um, uh, and uh, things like sensation um, issues, uh, loss of sensation uh, because of surgery. Uh, do you think that will be helped by shockwave therapy? It's one of the things that we're looking at. Uh, and certainly that's one of the outcomes that we're trying to see, whether or not uh, there may be some penile shortening due, just due to the process of the operation, but whether or not the idea of giving shockwave, trying to prevent that scar formation, whether or not that will actually prevent further shortening of the penis over that time. That's right. So um, it's a new novel intervention. It's been used for uh, erectile dysfunction across um, different patient groups, but we are choosing a particularly uh, challenging patient group to treat because we want to see uh, if uh, this modality actually has uh, long-term benefits for patients with ED and um, uh, for patients especially after cancer treatment. Now, um, Finn has gone through some of the evidence uh, behind uh, shockwave therapy in animals uh, and in uh, human studies, um, what what is um, what is the summation of your findings so far? Well, in rat models, a couple of rat models which is trying to sort of uh, 
Lucat, a model of prostatectomy within, within a rat. It's shown there's a few chemicals that are uptaking, whether or not there's new blood vessel formation, whether or not it can decrease some of the nerves that promote erectile dysfunction, and therefore hopefully promoting erectile function, and whether or not it promotes nerve regeneration. Now that's been shown on a chemical lab-based uh, level, uh, but whether or not that translates into actually what happens in human tissue, we don't know. Uh, certainly within um, the general erectile dysfunction population, by that caused by vessel problems, we call it vasculogenic ED, the data has been positive, but certainly hasn't been overwhelming uh, or significantly improved in a lot of the research that's been done. Uh, predominantly within penile rehabilitation, there has been a significant trial that was released just last year, uh, but that didn't involve a sham probe. Whenever we're doing clinical trials, we like to do a placebo-based trial in order to have proper comparison between the two groups. And that's what our trial is doing. So patients will either get uh, a sham probe, which sounds uh, and feels exactly like uh, a normal probe, or they'll get an active probe, and only by that way we'll truly understand whether or not this is going to be beneficial. And obviously if it is, it's going to be fantastic technology that we can utilise in all of our post prostatectomy pathways across the country, hopefully. Yeah, so um, uh, this is hopefully going to be groundbreaking in that it's the first uh, randomised trial using a sham versus an active uh, probe to try and identify um, if um, this is some benefit to uh, uh, cancer patients after prostate cancer surgery. Now, we, we have used uh, shortwave therapy, a lot of um, practitioners have done this uh, for um, other issues to do with penis, um, like perineus disease and um, mild uh, erectile dysfunction um, to variable benefit. There's some papers that show um, some benefit uh, when they collect the different trials together, uh, but um, that's the issue. When you collect different trials together, you've got different devices, uh, different sorts of energy, different kinds of uh, patient groups in, in, um, uh, included. So this, in a way, is a clean uh, slate. We are looking at patients um, completely from this group who've had um, a cause that we've identified uh, causing erectile dysfunction, which is their prostate surgery. So these patients um, haven't had erectile dysfunction before. Uh, otherwise, unfortunately, they're excluded from the trial. And so we know the cause and we are trying to find out if this treatment with short waves is going to be um, as beneficial or even more beneficial than the standard treatment alone, which is to give tablets, um, things like Viagra, along with using a vacuum pump uh, to help maintain penile length. So the trial looks at the short wave machine in addition to standard treatment. Um, what we're also trying to look at is the safety of uh, the uh, device uh, when we do uh, these uh, treatments after uh, big cancer surgery. Um, in the small uh, numbers of papers that have been published before, there wasn't a safety issue, but again, that's something that we're really interested in looking at. Um, Finn, do you know um, uh, what are the challenges um, uh, you know, you've faced uh, or other practitioners have faced uh, in the other trials? With regards to what? With regards to <laughs> the, the, the trial itself, running the trial and things like that. Um, I don't think it's been particularly, you know, m most, most patients and participants are fairly energised to receive new technologies that may potentially help them. Uh, particularly with our trial, obviously it's a post-cancer trial, which is different to a lot of the trials that have been published. So we're having to be quite strict with regards to those that come in. Uh, in order to make sure that their oncological safety and oncological uh, management is, 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 at the, uh, is paramount. Um, obviously ours is also time sensitive, so we have only a couple of weeks in order to be able to recruit patients into the trial, whereas for the other trials the recruitment's been quite easy, yeah. we have a big patient population. Yeah. There's certainly, as you said, be no safety concerns, no problems with that, um, and certainly retention into the active arm of those trials has been totally, uh, totally 100%. Uh, the, the dropout rate tends to be more in the sham, sham arm in those that haven't been there, so they have a good, good cover-up with regards yeah. to Richard the sham probe. Yeah. So with this uh, quite um, uh, difficult to treat patient group, we're actually putting the uh, shortwave uh, uh, therapy to, to a test, a real test. Um, this is um, a group of patients that often do not respond to uh, even the normal um, erectile dysfunction therapies that we have discussed like uh, Viagra and things like that. So we shall see. Uh, it's exciting for us. And uh, the other thing that would be interesting for us to, to know is how long these effects last for. Is it going to be a permanent effect? Do they need to repeat it um, after a year? Um, you know, 
what what is um, the duration of uh, the short wave effect if it offers an additive effect? So uh, lots of interesting data come from it. Um, uh, we uh, welcome your participation either in um, uh, you know getting involved from a clinician point of view or from a patient point of view. So we aim to um, uh, recruit as many uh, interested uh, patients as we can, but there has to be some um, uh, contraindications, unfortunately, to, for patient safety. So Finn, do you want to go through what the contraindications are for, for our trial? Absolutely. So uh, we have a fairly strict oncological uh, exclusion criteria. So we have fairly relatively low risk cancer that's been operated on as you might expect. Uh, those that have had any complication or any pelvic or genital abnormalities, because that might be influenced because of the shockwave delivering energy to that area. Uh, additionally, anybody that has uncontrolled blood thinning disorder, obviously, that makes fairly total sense. Um, and apart from that, really, there's not much else apart from the intricacies within the trial itself. Um, we're aiming to give one, one session a week for 12 weeks, uh, and we've got a fairly strict follow-up rigid pathway at, at our hospital. And we follow patients up, up until 24 months following their surgery. And that really is patient-reported outcome data, uh, so it's really the patients telling us what uh, their function is like. And we compare that to baseline preoperative function to their outcome function up to two years to see if we've got back to baseline, improved from baseline, or whether or not we haven't achieved that at all. Yeah, so for, for our trial patients, we um, are actually quite um, closely monitoring their outcomes. So uh, it's outcomes at three months. So that's right after they finish their course of uh, short waves. Um, six months, uh, nine months, 12 months, and then 18 and then 24 months. Um, we've got some novel ways of collecting this data, but uh, essentially Finn is absolutely right. It's uh, patient reported. Um, during the actual short wave uh, trial sessions, uh, with, uh, with the probe, we will be monitoring their response, um, the patient response to, to the session, then to find out um, if there's any pain, for example, that there hasn't been much of an issue uh, yet, but it's not something that we look out for. Um, and we also look for things like bruising um, and um, uh, you know, pain when they get home, um, any signs of infection, uh, things like that. All these we haven't encountered uh, yet, but it's something we'll be uh, looking at. Thank you.